Passa a bola pra ti! Meteoro de desgraça! Right, well, sick. Yeah, cheers for that one, mate. The ball's gone miles. Hey, babe, by the way, did you know that on Boxing Day in 1963, the Premier League results were absolutely crazy? Like, oh, shut up, man. I've heard it every year. Help, guys, I'm still drowning from last week. <laughs> Man, if I'd just become a lawyer like my dad said, I wouldn't have to deal with these dead footballers all the time. Guys, it is your boy Niran here, and you are watching FTW. It is, of course, the series where I bring to the best and more frequently the worst of what football has to offer during the last seven days. What's been kicking off in the world this week? Well, there's been a small matter of Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all of you. I hope you had a wonderful time with your respective families. And for those that don't celebrate, I hope you had a great time anyway, and you still ate a lot of food. Santa Claus, though, was on the move, and his tracker was brought to you by Sky Spot, oh, for God's sake. Yeah, now, so basically, lad, I'm gonna ask you to stop it there. And ho, 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 a little bit closer. Oh, Right. I was in the kitchen watching all the cooking taking place, barely even knowing how to make a gravy. Bevo's family were in awe as he ate an entire cabbage hole at the dinner table. Meanwhile, Michael Owen famously reckons that Christmas is underrated. By who? Everyone loves Christmas. It's 13 days of Christmas for him, though. Hold on, he's 13. He was preparing to throw a Brussels sprout in the bin from 25 yards away. Meanwhile, it's the same gift as always for me again. Honestly, Lynx Africa's done more for the continent than the World Cup of 2010 did. Africa. Now though on to the football and we start with a Premier League top of the table clash from just before Christmas as Arsenal and Liverpool drew 1-1 in a fixture otherwise known as the Statement Derby. It started horribly for us with Gabriel scoring a header just five minutes in and I thought Croquet was making an early return. Oh, how positively preposterous. But Mo Salah equalised with a brilliant goal and Alexander Zinchenko was in bits seeing Mo come towards him. We were accused of overwatering the pitch here as players were slipping over left, right and centre. <laughs> and Bukayo Saka had an excuse for why they were only drawing at half time. We mustn't forget that it's been raining so far. Are you being serious? But the game itself must have looked totally different to Martin Odegaard because he played a different sport inside the penalty area and somehow a spot kick wasn't given. Is that Michael Jordan, mate? There's a totally different badge on the sleeve of his shirt. Martin Odegaard versus a teenage Gerald Kwanzaa was a bit of a mismatch as we can see here. Even William Saliba thought it was a penalty at full time. I'll to ask you, do you think it was a penalty, the handball with Martin? Yeah, of course, <laughs> of course, uh, it, it was a penalty, but I'm not the, the ref on, on the effort, so. Virgil van Dijk had the novel approach of asking the referee if he'd been drinking during this one after a decision didn't go his way. He probably was pouring one out to deal with Arsenal's horrible away kit. This is what the VAR room was looking like before kickoff. Costas Simicas received a collarbone injury that will keep him sidelined after the unique situation of a collision with his own manager. Jurgen Klopp got up from the situation looking worse for wear too. And after Simicas did completely clean out his own manager, their handshake at the club Christmas dinner is going to be a little bit tense. There was a massive moment though at 1-1 with 12 to go as Liverpool was set through on a 5v1 counter only for Trent Alexander-Arnold to hit the bar. I've never even seen one of these before by the way. Poor Declan Rice was in an unenviable situation but according to some Gunners fans did enough to distract Trent despite doing absolutely nothing at all. I mean he's not the reason that we didn't score here. Declan you are a genius. I literally didn't do anything. All I did was put the oven on and it was on the wrong temperature. At Manchester United now and I'll give you three guesses at what's happened to them this week. Called for a change of ownership? Probably. Lost the game? Most definitely. But yep, yeah, that's right, folks. Marcus Rashford has a new trim. He's about to go wild this summer, lads. I can't even lie. He might now look like the top of a Duracell battery, but Sir Marcus Gashford was unable to save United from a 2-0 defeat at the hands of West Ham. Goals came from Jared Bowen and Mohamed Kudus winning it for them, and I'd say West Ham burst his bubble, but Eric Ten Hag's noggin did that as it is. The left back is the only thing sure in this squad, because Eric Ten Hag was devastated when a present under his Christmas tree wasn't in the 
shape of an entirely new full starting 11. This is what supporting United does to a child. Meanwhile, for West Ham, an illiteral nipple kept a clean sheet. Alejandro Garnacho and Anthony combined for just one pass to Rasmus Hoyland in this game. The Dane would genuinely get more service in a sidemen charity match than in this squad and was left confused and frustrated seeing Anthony attempt to reverse 360 flip flat instead of putting the ball into the area. Anthony is from Bristol. You cannot convince me this man has a Brazilian passport. People are asking who Anthony Joshua should fight next after his scrap this week. The simple answer, Anthony. United now have new part ownership as Sir Jim Ratcliffe took a 25% stake in the club. Not the Qatari backer though and hence not the change of ownership that United fans really wanted. So he's going to have to try and convince them in his first press conference. Today I feel... Uh... Qatari. Meanwhile, one United fan on Twitter is still convinced that Jim will want to fix it. It's a bit of a weird analogy. And it wasn't going much better off the pitch before Boxing Day as well, as the release of Manchester United's hygiene rating at Old Trafford saw them get just a one, which means they need serious intervention in the canteen. I knew this guy wasn't cooking, but this is totally out of control. Imagine being a United fan tucking into a hot dog and noticing that it's got a chicken beak in it. I mean, honestly, guys, they've got no bite to them, produce shit and are barely still alive. And that's just the burger that I had from the canteen, mate. These lot are a football club. They shouldn't be on an episode sort of kitchen nightmares. Gordon Ramsay's got some words of advice when he sees Eric Ten Hag try and cook up Ayala. I love ambition. Absolutely fucking love it. But in this game, you've got to fucking walk before you can run. Meanwhile, he'll be straight out of Old Trafford when he realises that the food is shit and so is the football. I have the right to do the right thing. The right thing for me is to get out of here. But you know what, lads? There is at least some positives United fans can take away from this week. Then I might have an issue here. Manchester United did at least show some kind of fight on Boxing Day as they took three points with a wonderful comeback versus Aston Villa and a first goal for Rasmus Oiland. The miracle finally happened. And as you can see, he was absolutely delighted with the goal. <laughs> The bad thing about this goal, though, is he's still getting no service. This assist came from John McGinn. Obviously, Sean Millis has been offering his support to the Danish striker, having basically become a meme for him over the last couple of weeks. And honestly, the guy's going to go triple platinum after this goal. Though it will be mixed feelings, knowing this song is getting absolutely zero Rasmus Hoyland promo from here on in. He's going to have to get a little bit creative with his next campaign for United players, but will face some criticism when he dresses up as Andre Anana praying for a miracle clean sheet. This Black. Sorry, I'm being a fool. I actually am so happy for Sean here. As things stand, he's currently number one thanks to all the hype that Rasmus Hoyland has been able to generate. And this video was extremely touching of him finding out. You are number one in the UK on the viral charts. That's insane. I've never been first at anything. I mentioned Anana, things were very different in the first half for the Red Devils. United were shocking, conceding two goals of which Aston Villa used a very interesting technique of getting Leon Bailey to shout abuse at the Cameroonian. In fairness to United, a genuinely special comeback. They were appalling in the first half, so to show the fight that they did to come back and win 3-2 was impressive. Casemiro was watching on as the comeback took place, looking like an auntie in a supermarket. <laughs> But can this result inspire some level of confidence for Man United moving into the new year? Now, at Chelsea, and I'll give you three guesses of what's happened to them this week. Chelsea lost again, this time at the hands of Wolves, to top off a truly horrendous year. That wasn't very Christmassy. These Chelsea Christmas gift AI pictures are, are brilliant, because I genuinely think this is how kids would react if they got a Mudrick shirt. But the main talking point from this game was when it was still a nil-nil. Raheem Sterling steals the ball after a Joao Gomez mistake, and it is three Chelsea attackers versus Jose Sarr. Raheem Sterling doesn't square it and instead has his shot saved. This is honestly absolutely criminal. How likely are you to square it if you're one on one with a keeper and your teammate is open? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Mm. Declan Rice has done it again. I can't believe him not passing in this situation. Cole Palmer was, of course, furious. Sterling, pass it back. He's there. Sterling. Nicholas Jackson was even an option here as well. If Raheem Sterling fancied passing it to someone else that would also miss, he can't wait to get his hands on Raheem next time they're in training. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sterling himself is going to be in for a shock seeing Maurizio Pochettino's new hairline after the stress that he's caused him in this game. 
This situation might have been worse than the Liverpool one. Or I'm huffing on that Kobe. He wasn't the only one, though. Nicholas Jackson fucked two massive chances as well. Astrid Wett ain't calling him again after seeing this performance. Christopher Nkunku is the shining light in this team. The only thing that's not shit. But honestly, a stinky week again for the Blues. Who's worse, them or United? Just enjoy them, yeah. man. We're lucky very to be different in this Let's go global, though, for a sec, because Man City are Club World Cup champions. After a 4-0 slapping of Fluminense, the Brazilian side played some nice football, I can't lie. But Pep's side had too much for them in the end. They tweeted about winning the lot, every single trophy at their disposal. Although Southampton had something to say after knocking them out of the Carabao Cup last year. Julian Alvarez has literally completed football at this point. He's won the Club World Cup, the Premier League, Champions League, Copa Libertadores, World Cup, Wimbledon, and the entire PGA Tour at this point. Kevin De Bruyne was out celebrating on the town. Meanwhile, Phil Foden is now averaging a trophy every 15 games he plays. It's a lot of silverware for him and for Kyle Walker, who Man City had balancing all of the trophies with this edit. Gonna have a little bit more of a difficult time trying to balance all the charges that Man City are currently facing, though, because the trophies to investigations ratio at the club is still not looking all that good. And speaking of Kyle Walker, himself and Felipe Melo were going at it at full time. He posted on Insta saying no one starts on my jack. Now the reason for this, apparently Felipe Melo thought that Grealish was being disrespectful, shouting ole at the end of the game. Jack took to Twitter to say he never once said ole, something United will be saying to Solskjaer when he puts his CV back on the table. And honestly, I believe Jack in this situation. There's no way he can speak another language, let's be honest. Luton beat Newcastle unexpectedly this week as well, with a goal from Andros Townsend to heap some pressure onto the Magpies. Andros used it as a tribute to Tom Lockyer, who of course suffered from a cardiac arrest out on a pitch when Luton faced off against Bournemouth. A very sweet gesture from him. Anthony Gordon, though, was furious seeing a man who's been about since 2006 doing what he couldn't in this game. You have <laughs> ruined me again. Dan Byrne was officially too tall for the Kenilworth Road Tunnel. Meanwhile, after an Andros Townsend strike that landed on the roof, the ball did at least find its way through a hole and back into the stands. Gotta say, though, the promoted sides are definitely getting better after Sheffield United claimed some points v Villa, though Luton's manager isn't appreciating that grandma from the stands, suggesting they go into a 6-3-1 formation for the final five minutes. Oh, well, she's fuck off. As for Newcastle, though, they're running out of players right now through injuries. They're gonna have Will Any playing in midfield by next weekend. Tottenham faced off against Everton and won, with Richarlison scoring yet again against his former side. He actually started celebrating, forgetting that he'd actually played for Everton in the past. He did pay his respects in the end, but I'm surprised he even did that, to be honest with you. At one stage, there were two balls on the pitch for an Everton chance. That isn't the reason for multi-ball, not gonna lie. But Chelsea, writing that one down. That might be a new tactic for scoring goals. At Nottingham Forest now, and Willie Bolly was the recipient of the softest red card in human history. Looking at this screenshot, you would not believe who was sent off for this challenge. People are calling it the worst call ever. The referee wouldn't have even made it into his changing room at halftime if it wasn't for the writing on the wall. I think it says red card. No, it says dressing room. What have I said about leaving your guide dog at home? And Forrest Admin wasn't letting the decision slide over on Twitter. There wasn't much Christmas spirit there, but there was around the rest of the Premier League, as Erling Haaland brought out his traditional Santa tweet. <laughs> Love that from him, flexing all of his trophies on Christmas Day. This is a man who definitely grows all the vegetables for his own Christmas dinner. It. Talking of traditions and Mo Salah brought the Christmas tree back out again. I do love this post, man. I love that he has respect for other traditions and other religions. He also decided to dedicate it to the poor children of Gaza and Palestine, but it will leave Harvey Elliott confused coming into training on Boxing Day. Uh, this guy, on oh my life, he switches it up every single day. Where's your Bible? At Newcastle, they visited a hospital to surprise some patients, and assistant Jason Tindall's choice of words probably wasn't the best. To all you Judies out there, and Newcastle fans around the world, wishing you a very Merry Christmas. And hopefully it's not your last Christmas. This gift probably wasn't the best for one young Tottenham fan who was gifted a Gilfy Sigurdsson shirt by his mum who didn't know any better. Meanwhile, Mike Dean appeared on TV with a VAR Humbug shirt. A pretty accurate top because VAR does make us depressed over the Christmas period. Back up in the north and we saw the fourth great gift of Christmas. Gold, frankincense, myrrh and wood. Yeah, I can't lie, mate. This is probably the shittest present of the lot. I mean, what are you even? Chris Wood, through the power of roast potatoes, scored a trick against New Newcastle to put even more misery onto Eddie Howe. This man ate a tub of celebrations and he's never seen so much energy and movement. Massive props though to Forrest, big result for them. Bern Leno was fuming as Fulham were losing 2-0 to Bournemouth, shoving a ball boy who was taking a little bit too long to give the ball back to him. I tell you what, if Neil Mopay finds out about this, Bern is done. Because I was it Leno got injured contact with me and then at Crystal Palace and this young fan saw his opportunity to give it large to rival Brighton supporters after slotting home in front of them. <laughs> 
It's a sh Housery Award for the youngster. Meanwhile, shout out to the Premier League's first ever female referee. Rebecca Welsh took charge of a game this week and did a really super, super job. Joey Barton's Christmas is absolutely ruined. Joey will be disgusted when he realizes that the turkey that's in the oven is actually a female one. Anyway, sorry, no, this is about Rebecca Welsh. Very happy for her and great to see more representation and inspiration in the league, which can also be said for Sam Allison, who became only the second black referee to ever referee in a Premier League match this week. Massive props to both of them breaking down boundaries for sure. Over in Spain now, and Real Madrid grabbed themselves a last minute win down to 10 men against Deportivo Alaves, a 92nd minute winner doing the job for them. Now, as I mentioned, they were down to 10 men, and so Alaves's manager probably thought they had a point in the bag. Hence his reaction when they ended up losing the game was, well, it was pretty bad. <laughs> Before this game, though, when Alaves had actually left ham sandwiches out for all of their fans on each of the seats, I think 20,000 of them, as like a little Christmas gift and a bit of free food. Vegans, however, will have been fuming turning up to the ground and seeing this. Imagine this happened at Old Trafford. The queue for the toilet to be six kilometers long. And imagine Barcelona trying to copy this trend and afford all of this food. Well, they give you the money. You're lying. Elsewhere during this game, and Antonio Rudiger was, uh, being Antonio Rudiger. Meanwhile, off the pitch, Eduardo Camavinga has found himself yet another profession. This time, he's become a photographer, as posted here on IG. Please, Eduardo, I'm getting tired of using this audio every single week, so if you could just stop. Tony Kroos was pictured with his dad being nice and wholesome for Christmas. One fan asked him whether it was actually his dad, to which Tony sarcastically responded, it's his brother. To be honest, the amount of time Tony's been in the Real Madrid starting 11, it could well be. Takefusa Kubo was getting some very rub bus treatment playing for Real Sociedad this week. First of all, getting flung about like a rag doll, And then second of all, for something that wasn't actually punished, being basically uppercutted towards the end of the game. I don't think Deontay Wilder even faced a shot that powerful. Meanwhile, Rodrigo de Paul has a new trim at Atletico Madrid, and I hate it. No. He looks like David Beckham from Woucher. Someone said this is Sean DePaul. You know, I've had enough, man. He's gone full for lady mode. Elsewhere, though, and in the stands, this Atletico girlfriend is not having any of the waffle in her ear. I'm just saying, yeah, if I was to have that trim, I'd pull it off better. You're not doing it, Pablo, and that's final. Over in Italy now, and speaking of new trims, Paul Pogba's actually gone too far. You know what? Graham Sules might have been right all along. Now, look, listen, I know I am not qualified to talk about haircuts, all right? We've seen the state that I... But this is the trim of a man who's been doping. It's like his haircut lags halfway through. Low chemistry from forehead to neck. Milan dropped points yet again this week, but that didn't stop Fikayo Tomori from celebrating his goal extremely badly. Jose Mourinho was posing for the cameras over at Roma. Jose, it's Christmas, not Valentine's Day. You don't have to be that seductive with it. And he must have smelt what was already cooking because they went on to beat Napoli 2-0 in this one. And listen, the same week that Napoli striker Victor Osimhen signed a new deal to keep him at the club till 2026. He might have to find a way to unsign that contract pretty swiftly. The nerve of Napoli's owner, by the way, to suggest they want to join the Super League when they can't even handle their own league. And for Moise Keane, he's been active outside the world of football this week, releasing the music video for a new tune that he's dropped. Don't me, can me, bro? No. This man is hitting bars on and off the pitch. I'm telling you now, yeah, I saw someone tweet about this, but if I had a striker at my club that had scored no goals at this point yet in December and he released a music video, my head is on Neptune, mate. No hits, just misses in the studio and on the pitch. We're getting sent straight back into the hood with this one. In Germany, Harry Kane is a big fan of Burner Boy. One man asked what other African artists he enjoyed listening to. You said you like a big seven from Banner Boy. Yes. Apart from Banner Boy, who are you listening from? Artists from Africa. Oh, good question. Um... Uh... Yeah, Burner Boy is my guy, man. Yeah. yeah. This guy looks straight at the camera. He knows what he's doing with that question. That's outrageous. Harold was fighting for his life to name just one other black artist, but was defiant later on in the interview naming Wizkid after 20 minutes. Thank you to everybody that come out here tonight. I'm made for this game, and anybody who wants it can have it. People underestimated me. And I can't lie to you, lads. His Spotify rap is going to be looking very different next year as he prepares to be asked that question again in 2024. Why is everyone black? 
啊！哦、oh, ，哎 ，Young Star Boy Jamal Musiala missed out on some action this week because of his wisdom tooth. Mental excuse, but you know what it is? I totally hear it, bro. They're so painful. All I'm saying though is, yeah, if you tried that under Antonio Conte, he's giving you 25% of a paracetamol, telling you to eat some Colgate and then get on with it. Oh. At the top of the Bundesliga table, and Bayer Leverkusen are still unbeaten. I don't have a joke or a gag for this section. That's just insane. They've now set a league record for being unbeaten at the start of a season. Meanwhile, there's no such thing as a winter break over at Union Berlin, as their supporters are still turning up to games through thick and thin, this time in the form of under-19 futsal. And in France, Kylian Mbappe gate-crashed his younger brother's interview after Ethan made his debut against Mets last week. Uh, he's just wanting to steal the spotlight here, to be honest with you, isn't he? He must have been confused reading that Canal Plus only wanted to interview Ethan and not him. Meanwhile, for Leon, they've been struggling this season, have at least hit some form though, and their youngster Ryan Shirky is not letting bad weather get in the way of him training as they look to continue that form into the new year. Now that it's time for your goals of the week, we're keeping it short and sweet with the first one as Alex Tayez in Saudi Arabia unleashes a thunderous left-footed volley. <laughs> And then for the acrobatics, finally, over in India, where Nigerian Daniel Chima grabbed himself a hat-trick for Jamshedpur, but one was firmly the pick of the bunch. Now, over in Saudi Arabia, there were some special guests for the Deontay Wilder-Joseph Parker fight, as Cristiano Ronaldo and Conor McGregor found themselves sat next to each other. I'm sure Big Ron was pretty impressed with it all. He probably saw a lot more fight that evening than from most other teams in the Saudi Pro League. He slapped a picture with Conor McGregor onto Instagram, asking for a caption, but the choice of music probably could have been a little bit better from a man who's definitely banned from entering America. This video, though, was spectacular. Cristiano Ronaldo was not interested in this conversation at all. He looks like me at the Christmas dinner table hearing my uncle talk about his outrageous political views again. Look, obviously, I would never be racist, right? But I'm just saying I think there should be a lot more white people in the UK these days, because, like, I'm not being funny. What even kind of name is Niran? Like, what fuck's sake, get me out of here. Hello, all, and welcome to the beautiful game, the segment where we take a look at the poetic and brilliant side of the game that we love. We are back by popular demand for yet more glorious beauty. <laughs> Hell, man. And that concludes the beautiful game. Now, up in Scotland, and there were some surreal scenes at our bros. As whilst 1 0 up, might I add, before you even see this, one forward for them was clearly not too pleased about his teammate taking on a strike instead of playing it into him in the centre. Because as the ball dribbled out wide, a scrap between the two of them ensued, ending with a red card and a pretty awkward changing room at full time. And there's more scrapping going on in Turkey. I know. Shock. Nah, I never knew that. As Fenerbahce played sworn enemies Galatasaray in the league, a Christmas Eve treat that provided a lot of spice between Edin Dzeko and Mauro Icardi, as the latter was pushed into the goal frame, leading to him having a black eye at full time. Galatasaray posted about this, calling into question the refereeing decision. Twitter did the usual by not taking it seriously whatsoever, but one man that did take it seriously was Edin Dzeko. The Fenerbahce striker hit out at Galatasaray, saying that Mauro had simply ran into the post and they were looking for unnecessary sympathy. This face-off was dramatic. Though, to be honest, Mauro was probably just happy to finally not be in an argument with his wife for once. There's the revelation that Turkish football actually continues on to Christmas Day. That's why they're scrapping all the time. They just want a day off, for God's sake. Young Matteo Messi, son of Lionel Messi, scored a beautiful bicycle kick this week. This is a better bicycle kick than his dad brought out. Meanwhile, speaking of special goals, we've got a lovely tribute here coming from a friendship group and family who, at a funeral, decided to bring out a classic and touching team goal, ending with the ball going in off a coffin and into the back of the net for one final goal. A truly lovely tribute, but surely there's a handball in the build-up, guys. Come on. There's being in the box, and then there's this. You get it? Because he's he's in a box because of the cop. That just seems wildly inappropriate, Stephen. Goal given! Closer to home and down in the championship, Coventry slapped up Sunderland and brought out the coldest caption of the year. The Stadium of Light Work. Their admin is a student at Coventry University, and you cannot convince me otherwise. This was a game in which Jude Bellingham went to go and watch his younger brother Joe. And upon knowing this information, Casey Palmer scored against his brother's side and brought out the Jude celebration. Over at Norwich and in their game versus Huddersfield, unimaginable fury is flying between their two sets of fans. 
And as Ipswich faced off against Leeds United, former Leeds left back Leif Davis was going to play against his former side. To which one Ipswich Town supporter said that you should bet your mortgage, your house and your family on him scoring a goal. I mean, look, it's a goal of a kind, isn't it? Do they pay out on each way for this? Or now, if you thought it was cold in the UK at the moment, you should try living in Norway. I mean, in a world first, you're going to end up with three players getting injured before they've even reached the pitch. Over in North Africa and in the Egyptian Super Cup, Ricardo Formazinho used to work with Jose Mourinho, and he has just helped guide his side to victory in that cup. Now, Jose had been keeping tabs on this game, and halfway through a press conference after the match, Ricardo got a familiar call. <laughs> But these guys, I have to, Jose Mourinho, I have to, okay, I'm sorry, boss. Over in Azerbaijan, and genuinely, I want to see betting slips checked, because this own goal, you cannot tell me, this has not been slotted into the back of the net on purpose. Meanwhile, at Hapoel Beersheva, if you're going to let the ball into the back of your own net, you might as well do it with some level of style. There is at least some sort of better football going on in Germany, though, where this youth game is seeing some spectacular football, to say the age group and level it's at. Even the goalkeepers bringing out the five star skills. In Kuwait and after a team were unhappy with refereeing decisions at full time, they decided to go and search out for the official, only for him to start giving it back and for a scrap to start in a room afterwards. And speaking of refs and potentially controversial decisions, this feline is about to be suspended. You're banned! Now there is time for still nil-nil and you guys know the score by now. This is a segment of the show where I bring to you the best of Sunday League and amateur football. And I'm sure you know all about this, but Sunday League football, it's a tough place. you got to have strength, determination, and more importantly, you got to be made of strong stuff. Because some of the challenges that fly in are serious. Now for this picture, I'm going to have to genuinely pixelate it because YouTube will not like it. But somehow, three massive gashes down this player's leg only resulted in a yellow card. Has he been tackled by Wolverine for fuck's sake? What was this guy? I wear it on his feet. Ice skates. On to the weird stuff though now. First of all, Japanese legend Shunsuke Nakamura scored a hat-trick of free kicks this week. Even though he was known as a free kick specialist back in his playing days, that is still an incredible feat. And finally, this is more of a continuation of a story that happened last week. Of course, you'll probably remember Ajax being knocked out of the Dutch Cup by fourth division amateur minnows in probably the biggest shock of the Cup's history. Well, the story gets even more mental than that. As one of the goal scorers in this game was in fact a student in his local area. Well, a week before the game, himself and his friends were out partying, went back to their house and indulged in some illegal substances, only to decide to then make a bet on him scoring in the game. The odds were 750 to 1. They stuck a decent amount of money on it, and of course, with him scoring, that bet came in, and it meant that they have earned a ridiculous amount of money off the back of a bet they made at an afters. And it really is proof that you should do important things whilst intoxicated. I'm joking. Please don't do that though is gonna wrap up football this week and I hope you have enjoyed it If you have then feel free to slap a like on the video and of course subscribe if you're new to the channel You can also follow me on social media. It is at the official FNG on Twitter and on Insta but It's been a pleasure ranting at you guys today. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy yourselves and goodbye <laughs>